questions in the chat. So thank you and uh, let's hear what Dr. Amolo has to say. Welcome Dr. Amolo. Thank you, Tanya. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here and I hope you're going to have a, a, an interactive and fruitful discussion. So I will just um, try to share my slides. And I think the admin is also still trying to launch the poll questions. So just give me a minute. Sure, um, uh, take, take, take your time. I'm sure everybody needs to grab a piece of paper, a comfortable seat, maybe some coffee or tea. So we're looking forward to the session. And I'm sure everybody is here because um, they know this is quite a, um, an interesting topic and it's something that's very important. At the moment, we have more than 500 attendees. So yes, maybe people can tell us in the meantime where they're from as we're waiting for the session to begin. You can type it in the chat. What part of Kenya are you from? Okay, we've got Kiambu, we've got Meru, Turkana. Oh, wow. Kwale, Mombasa, Nairobi, Nakuru, Busia, Mandera, Bungoma, Westlands, which Nairobi. Okay, Webuye. So it's quite a good representation from. Oh, Kisumu, it's quite a few from Nairobi. West Pokot, Simon, welcome. Um, very good representation from Kenya, so the, from everywhere. Okay, I can see Doc is ready. Thank you. Great, are you able to see the slides? Yes, uh, we can. Thank okay, you. and I'm audible enough? Perfect, we can hear you clearly. Awesome. Okay, great. So can we start? Oh. Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. So good afternoon, everyone again. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to this session that you're going to have on uh, hypoglycemia in children. This is quite a broad topic, so it's uh, not possible to cover everything uh, that uh, requires uh, discussion with regards to hypoglycemia, but I'll try to highlight the important uh, points. Um, like I said, it will be a bit interactive. We'll have a few poll questions. Uh, please don't fear to answer. The polls will be anonymous. And um, yeah, so I think we can proceed. So Okay, um, so this is the outline of the talk. So we are going to look at the definitions and we'll see why we are talking about definitions of hypoglycemia. We'll look uh, briefly at blood glucose regulation because it's important for us to understand this, for us to be able to understand the etiology. And then we look at the clinical presentation and finally the management. So I'll just start with uh, just a brief history of our case, a patient that we actually saw um, and we are currently following up in Kenyatta. This is a neonate who had been referred um, in December of 2020 from a facility in Nairobi. They were referred on the first day of life with a history of twitching, persistent hypoglycemia, or well, not persistent, but had several episodes of hypoglycemia and uh, was, was also reported to have abnormal genitalia. This child had been born by spontaneous vertex delivery at term and the birth weight was uh, 3,900 grams. So the blood sugar glucose from what I was able to obtain from the record is, uh, it was ranging uh, from below one to uh, 4.4 during the period where, uh, of admission in newborn unit. Um, so when, this is not the, the whole examination, but I've just picked out what is pertinent. When we examined the child, the child, the baby was alert, head circumference was okay. The only notable finding was mild jaundice and the baby also had a microphallus of uh, 2.2 centimeters and bilateral and descended testes. So that's just a brief. We'll come back to discuss this case as we go along. So I'll just go into uh, hypoglycemia, the introduction. So we all know that glucose is the main source of energy for the cell and um, any disorder that affects its availability will cause hypoglycemia. 
And hypoglycemia can be defined as a biochemical symptom that indicates the presence of an underlying problem. Okay, hypoglycemia has been found to be most common in the immediate postnatal period. It's very rare in adolescents, and and uh, the age is very important because it helps us to assess the probable uh, the the differential the possible differential diagnosis of hypoglycemia, and it's also a common it's also common in in uh, in, in patients with type one diabetes. So um, looking at the definitions of hypoglycemia, there's, uh, especially with regard to neonatal hypoglycemia, there is no consensus on the definition. So you might find some variations in the definitions because we still don't have enough evidence as to what level of hypoglycemia is clinically significant, okay? So for the purposes of this discussion, um, I will use a, a definition of two sequential two or more sequential blood glucose values of less than 2.2 to 2.5. And uh, the WHO uh, defines hypoglycemia as a glucose of less than three millimoles per liter in children with severe malnutrition. Now for patients with diabetes or patients who are on, on, on insulin or oral hypoglycemic agents, the definition is different. We use a cutoff of four. So any glucose of less than four is considered hypoglycemia in a patient with diabetes. Now, still on the definitions, um, we can also define hypoglycemia based on what we call the Whipple's triad. And the Whipple's triad basically includes the presence of hypoglycemic symptoms, um, the, uh, the presence of a low blood glucose, and the resolution of, of the symptoms with normalization of the, the blood glucose. So that is what we call Whipple's triad. So looking at the, uh, just a bit on the epidemiology locally, I'm just presenting local data. So studies done in our setup have found the prevalence of hypoglycemia to be uh, high, especially in the neonates, yeah, of uh, ranging between 19 to 23% which is significant. And in, uh, in the neonate, it's slightly lower at 3.6 to 7.3%. Um, I, would, I would like us to launch the poll question. Are we able to launch the question? The first question? Thank you. So I would just like us to just answer this question. The poll, as I said before, is anonymous. So I will not, we will not be able to tell who answered what. It's just for purposes of learning. So this is the question. Uh, hypoglycemia in children, which of the following is not a complication of hypoglycemia? Okay, so basically we are saying all these are complications except one. So A is epilepsy, B weight gain, C reduced um, IQ, D mortality, and E none of the, none of the above. We have about 30 seconds to answer the question, to send in our, our answers. So I think we can see the answers we have. Okay, great. So majority say weight gain is not a complication of hypoglycemia. That's 57%. And then 22% say epilepsy is not a complication. So let's see. Um, so what are the complications of hypoglycemia? Why are we worried about hypoglycemia? Okay, studies have shown that uh, the presence of hypoglycemia is associated with neurocognitive defects. Um, and even the risk, there's, there's, it's associated with the, the risk of epilepsy, development of epilepsy later in life. And especially in patients, in children who have hyperinsulinism, 
it's been found that about 40% may actually have severe neurodevelopmental delay. So that is one of the complications we're worried about. Of course, there's a risk of mortality, okay? There's a embarrassment and anxiety, like for patients, especially for children with diabetes, it's, it's, uh, it can put them in, they can feel uh, like it's embarrassing for them to, you know, just uh, pass out in public, okay? And uh, it causes also fear for the patients and even for the parents of, of these children who have hypoglycemia. So it can even interfere with the management. And then weight gain, it's actually a complication. It's not a direct complication, but it's associated with the management of hypoglycemia. Patients who get frequent hypoglycemia tend to ingest a lot of uh, carbohydrates and dextrose to correct the hypoglycemia. So in the long term, they actually tend to get weight gain. So that is a complication. Okay, so moving on. So why, again, why is it important? So looking at a study done in Kilifi by Osier um, et al, they found that the mortality of, uh, due to hypoglycemia was quite high, just 45.2%. Um, this is among neonates, 45.2% compared to 19.6% uh, in normal glycemic neonates. And in children, um, the mortality was still high at 20% compared to just 3.8% in normal glycemic children. So this is something important um, that we should not miss out. So I'll just move on to blood glucose regulation, just briefly look at it. And uh, blood glucose regulation basically involves the balance between production and utilization. So production, just to remind ourselves about uh, biochemistry, production basically involves processes such as uh, glycogenolysis, where you're breaking down glycogen from the stores, and gluconeogenesis, where you're synthesizing glucose, okay? And then we have um, <clears throat> utilization of, of glucose, okay? So this basically involves glycogen synthesis and then storage, uh, glycolysis and glucose oxidation. So looking at the hormones that are involved in blood glucose regulation, this is very important for us to understand because it will guide us to the possible causes of hypoglycemia, okay? So we have insulin and then we have the counter-regulatory hormones. So glucagon, epinephrine, growth hormone, and cortisol. So insulin and the counter-regulatory hormones actually do the opposites or do uh, the exact, of whatever, in, uh, insulin does the exact opposite of what? the counter-regulatory hormones do. So insulin basically builds up. So it inhibits hepatic glycogenolysis. Uh, glyco glycogen, uh, glycogenolysis. It inhibits hepatic gluconeogenesis and it inhibits um, uh, lipolysis and it inhibits ketogenesis. So basically it prevents production of glucose, okay? Now, on the other hand, glucose, epinephrine, growth hormone, and cortisol, which are the counter-regulatory hormones, they do the exact opposite, and then they increase production of glucose. So um, there are the body has physiological defenses against hypoglycemia, okay? So whenever a patient has, or a person has hypoglycemia, we have the counter-regulatory hormones uh, uh, being produced, okay, or increased production of the counter-regulatory hormones. So we have increased epinephrine, increased cortisol, growth hormone, and glucagon. And we have a reduction in glucose, in, sorry, in insulin, okay? And uh, this results in increased, uh, increased uh, fatty acid break, uh, free, uh, breakdown of, uh, of lipids to produce ketones, which are an alternative source of energy when you don't have glucose, okay? We have um, uh, counter-regulatory hormones also reduce insulin sensitivity, and they also increase protein breakdown. Uh, resulting in gluconeogenesis. So just looking at the newborn briefly, what happens in the newborn? So in utero, the, the, the fetus is, is, is basically totally dependent on glucose supply from the mother, okay? There's hardly any uh, glucose synthesis uh, in the fetus. So after delivery, we have cessation of maternal supply of glucose, and this results in a surge uh, in the counter-regulatory hormones that you've already mentioned. And also, it also res results in a reduction in insulin levels. So that triggers the, the, the processes that we have talked about, the biochemical processes that try to generate uh, uh, glucose in the newborn, okay? So 
anything that may interfere with this process, okay, which we are going to look at, some of the risk factors will cause, uh, it predispose the neonates to hypoglycemia. So just looking at the clinical presentation, I think I will, I would like us to just take a poll. Can you launch the poll question? Thank you. So risk factors for hypoglycemia include the following except. So again, the poll is anonymous. So risk factors for hypoglycemia include the following except. So which one is not a risk factor in other words? So small for gestational age, large for gestational age, maternal diabetes, Cushing syndrome, and inborn errors of metabolism. Which one is not a risk factor for hypoglycemia? Okay, I think we can have the answers. Okay, great. So 35%, uh, that's the majority, uh, say small for gestational age is not a risk uh, factor for hypoglycemia, and 32% say Cushing syndrome. So let's see. Um, oh, sorry. I think that was a wrong poll question, by the way. Uh, but anyway, it's okay. We'll we'll come back to that. Eh? So let's just look at the the symptoms of hypoglycemia. Uh, wait, did I skip something? Ah, okay. So so it's a it's a head. <laughs> Okay, so we'll just look at the clinical presentation and then we'll come back to the risk factors. So these are the symptoms, uh, the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. I think with this, would you kindly launch the next question? I think there was a question on, on signs and symptoms before you move on to this. Admin, kindly launch the next question so that I don't preempt. Yeah, yes, this was the question. Sorry about that mix up. So children with hypoglycemia may present with all of the following except A, shakiness, B, nightmares, C, loose tools, D, difficulty hearing, and E, inconsolable crying. So which one is not a, a symptom? Or uh, yeah, it's not a symptom of hypoglycemia. Okay, I think we can see the results. Okay, great. So, um, so 40% say loose tools is not a symptom of hypoglycemia. And then there are a few who say nightmares and difficulty in hearing are not a symptom. So let's see. So what are the symptoms of hypoglycemia in children? We look at in children and then we look at neonates. So for for children, we we have uh, we can categorize the signs and symptoms into four into four groups. So we have we may have autonomic signs and symptoms. We will have neuroglycopenic uh, signs and symptoms. We'll have behavioral signs and symptoms, and then we have non-specific symptoms. So autonomic signs and symptoms are usually the first to present. Okay, so they occur at a higher glucose level. So they're kind of like warning signs that will alert a person that they're developing hypoglycemia. And then subsequently, if there's no response, then you develop neuroglycopenic symptoms because of reduced glucose supply to the brain. So some of these uh, autonomic signs include shakiness, sweatiness, trembling, palpitations, and pallor. Uh, 
Then the neuroglycopenic signs and symptoms include poor concentration. They may have slurred speech, difficulty hearing, okay? They may have uh, problems with short-term memory, and, and sometimes uh, they may even present with loss of consciousness or even seizures, as we've seen in, in the patient that I presented. And then be, we may also have behavioral signs and symptoms. And this one, you really need to be keen because it may not be so obvious. The patient may, or the person may just present with the change, altered mood. They may just be irritable or they may just have erratic behavior, okay? And they may actually present with nightmares. If they have nighttime hypoglycemia, they might actually present with nightmares. So if a, a parent tells you that my child wakes up with nightmares, especially if they are, for example, if they're diabetic, then you need to investigate for possible nocturnal hypoglycemia. And they may also, for, especially for the younger children, they may just present with inconsolable crying. And then of course, you may have non-specific symptoms like hunger, headache, nausea, which we all usually experience when you're really hungry. So those are some of the signs of hypoglycemia. Now for neonates, it's more tricky because it, the, the, sympt uh, this, this, um, the symptoms are, and signs are non-specific, okay? All these symptoms and signs that are listed here may be a feature of any, in any illness in a neonate. So you really need to have a high index of suspicion and, and even uh, preempt by screening uh, for hypoglycemia. And of some, uh, some patients may just present with no symptoms at all. So they may be asymptomatic. So you may have cyanosis, tachypnea, apnea, poor feeding, lethargy, bradycardia, and you may even get uh, a patient may may have uh, may get sudden death. Um, so in terms of the severity, and this applies mostly to the older children. For neonates, it may not really be applicable. Um, you can classify it into mild to moderate and severe. So if they have mild uh, or moderate hypoglycemia, usually the patient can recognize the symptoms. And for a patient with diabetes, for example, they'll be able to intervene. Although occasionally they may require assistance to intervene. Now, severe hypoglycemia is when there's severe cognitive impairment, including coma and convulsions. So any altered consciousness is an indication of severe hypoglycemia. And in such a case, the patient requires external assistance uh, for correction. So looking at, at the etiology and risk factors, so we already took that poll. So let's look at the risk factors um, <clears throat> for neonatal hypoglycemia. So you may have, uh, uh, neonatal hypoglycemia may be classified into two categories. You may have transient hypoglycemia and you may have persistent hypoglycemia. When do we say it's persistent? Usually if the hypoglycemia persists beyond three to five days. Remember we have said, uh, in the newborn, there's what we call in quotes, a physiological hypoglycemia due to that uh, adaptation to the extrauterine environment. So the first uh, one to two to three hours, they may actually have uh, a hypoglycemia, but that as the body adapts, they should, that should be able to resolve. So we have hypoglycemia persisting beyond day three, four, five, then that's a patient who requires further investigation. So what are the risk factors for transient hypoglycemia? Prematurity is one of the risk factors and small for gestational age because they don't have adequate, usually they don't have adequate glycogen stores, okay? Uh, the last uh, trimester, during the last uh, trimester of pregnancy, there's accumulation. They tend to accumulate large amounts of, of, of glucose and glycogen. So if they're born early, then their stores are likely to be less. So they're at risk. So small for gestational age is actually a, a risk factor for hypoglycemia. Large for gestational age is also a risk factor for hypoglycemia. And uh, this is mainly related to uh, possible maternal diabetes, okay? Not all patients who, have, uh, who are large for gestational age will have confirmed maternal diabetes in the mother, but it's suspected that they, the mother may, may, might have had um, recurrent hyperglycemia, which was not fixed during pregnancy, resulting in, in the infant being large for gestational age. And then any form of perinatal stress, sepsis, respiratory distress um, will predispose to hypoglycemia because of incre increased uh, glucose utilization. And then we have uh, causes of persistent hypoglycemia. So these are the ones that uh, we really need to aggressively uh, investigate, okay? And the commonest cause uh, is usually hyperinsulinemia. Okay, and this may be due to, there may be several causes. You may have genetic mutations, 
we may have uh, patients with beta cell hyperplasia, so they produce a lot of insulin. We may have a, a beta cell adenoma or even Beckwith with Demand syndrome. Then uh, we can also have, uh, so that is a hormone excess, then you can have hormone deficiency. So I like to categorize them into hormone excess and hormone deficiencies. And then you have inborn areas of metabolism. So hormone excess, you have hyperinsulinemia. Then hormone deficiencies, you have growth hormone deficiency, cortisol deficiency. Remember, these are the counter-regulatory hormones, yeah? Which increase glucose. So if they're deficient, you're going to get hypoglycemia. So cortisol deficiency may be primary, meaning the problem is at the level of the adrenal, or it may be secondary uh, from the pituitary. And then we can have inborn errors of metabolism, which we'll look at uh, a bit uh, later on. So just uh, something small on infants of diabetic mothers. Uh, why do they get hypoglycemia? Because of the uh, chronic or persistent or fluctuating hyperglycemia in the mother, the baby, the fetus also gets hyperglycemia and this results in pancreatic beta cell hyperplasia. So, once, so they have hyperinsulinism and then once they are born or after delivery, the hyperinsulinism persists. And now because they're out of the, that, the uterine environment, they develop hypoglycemia. So this is a picture of an infant of a diabetic mother. Usually they tend to, they usually, like you said, large for gestational age, although we have a few who may be small for gestational age. And uh, they tend to have these uh, cherubic fasces. And um, yeah, so whenever you have a large for gestational age baby, always remember to, that's a high risk patient for hypoglycemia. So just uh, looking at uh, genetic causes of hyperinsulinism, okay? I will not go into so much detail about this, but just to let you know that uh, during the process of insulin synthesis, you may have genetic defects that may result in hyperinsulinism, okay? So this is just the normal process of uh, insulin synthesis. You have uptake of glucose by the beta cell. This is the pancreatic beta cell. And this glucose is metabolized to uh, produce ATP, okay? And then this ATP uh, is utilized in an ATP-dependent potassium channel, okay? Which is usually open. So when you have an increase in ATP, this channel closes and this results in membrane depolarization. Now this membrane depolarization results in uh, opening of a voltage-gated calcium channel, allowing influx of calcium into the beta cell, okay? And then uh, with the influx of calcium, this results in uh, exocytosis of insulin-containing granules. So this ATP-dependent potassium channel, this is what I, I want us to focus on. We can have mutations uh, here resulting in hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. So this is where we have the et genetic etiologies of neonatal hyperglycemia, neonatal diabetes, and neonatal hypoglycemia. So if you have mutations in the genes involved in that uh, channel, the potassium channel, yeah? So we, can, we have these genes like sulfonylurea gene uh, and uh, KIR6.2 um, genes. These results can, uh, if you have loss of function mutations, this may result in hyperinsulinism. So just uh, briefly looking at uh, beckwith wiedemann syndrome, Okay, it's something we need to look out for because it's, it's a cause, it's a, it may be a cause of hyperinsulinism, which may be transient. Actually, in majority, it's usually transient. And these patients have a gene mutation that uh, results in uh, macro, macro, macroglossia, organomegalies, yeah. So they have macroglossia, they have uh, nephromegaly, they have pancreatic hyperplasia, and that is why you have the hyperinsulinism, okay? Some of them may present with cryptokidism. And uh, like I said, uh, up to, a, up to a, a half of them may have hypoglycemia. They may also have hyp uh, hepatomegaly. So this is a child with with vitamin syndrome and you can see the macroglossia there, uh, the omphalocil, yeah, and uh, mac microcephaly. So when do you, should you suspect hyperinsulinemia? So of course, if the patient has persistent hypoglycemia, and if they have high requirements of insulin, patients who have, uh, sorry, high requirements of, of glucose. So patients who have hyperinsulinism usually have very high requirements of glucose. If you're giving feeds and you're giving fluids, you're giving dextrose, and you find that you still have to, you have to keep increasing your dextrose, yeah? And you find that you, you need to give above eight milligrams per kg per minute, then you need to investigate that patient for hyperinsulinism. I'll, I'll just mention later on how to calculate the glucose infusion rate. Okay, 
Secondly, the absence of ketones should, uh, should it points towards the presence of hyperinsulinism. Remember, when you have insulin deficiency, you get increase in ketones. So if you have hyperinsulinism, you will have no ketones, okay? And then the thirdly, if you have any detect, det uh, detectable insulin in the presence of hypoglycemia. So when you have hypoglycemia, the body's automatic response is to reduce insulin production. So if this patient is hypoglycemic and you still be able, you're still able to detect insulin, then that tells you that you probably have hyperinsulinemia, okay? And then uh, fourthly, if, uh, if you give glucagon, and the plasma glucose increases, meaning the glycogen stores are, are okay, yeah? So when you give glucagon, they are able to increase their plasma glucose by more than 1.5. So that's, um, that is suggestive of hyperinsulinism. So these are the four things we think about. High glucose um, requirements, absence of serum ketones, the presence of detectable insulin, the presence of hypoglycemia, and an increase in, the, uh, in glucose following glucagon administration. Um, and I, I talked about hyperinsulinism because that is usually uh, the commonest cause, especially for neonatal. That is what you need to investigate for first. Um, so in terms of uh, etiology in children, okay, again, I like to classify them into hormone deficiencies, excess, and then you have metabolic diseases. So it's still the same. When you have uh, hormone deficiencies include growth hormone deficiency and cortisol deficiency, causes of excess insulin, uh, could be adenoma, could be exogenous insulin, okay? And how do, you con how, do you, how do you tell whether this is exogenous or endogenous insulin? By measuring your C-peptide level, okay? So if your C-peptide levels are, are low and your insulin is high, then that tells you that is exogenous insulin. And, and um, this happen, can happen, sometimes you may have people who are abusing drugs or even children being, it's, it can be one form of child abuse. So it's something that uh, needs to be, uh, to be sought for. And then ingestions like alcohol and oral hypoglycemics. And then we have metabolic diseases, which I'll, I'll just uh, briefly look at uh, in the next few slides. So under metabolic diseases, we have, uh, I have four categories here. We have uh, um, glucose processing defects. We have defects in alternative fuel production. We have uh, glycogen synthesis deficiency and disorders of hepatic glucose production. So, sorry, sorry about that. So just looking at the metabolic disease defects, so we can have glucose processing defects, uh, uh, and this basically affects um, like the, the um, processes like the Krebs cycle. So they interfere with the ability to generate ATP from glucose oxidation. And in these patients, usually the lactate levels are high. So whenever we're investigating patients for inborn errors of metabolism, one of the tests we usually want to do is lactate. If you have a high lactate, think about a possible um, inborn error of metabolism. Then we have, uh, you may have defect in alternative fuel production. Remember if in, when you have prolonged fasting, the body triggers mechanisms to, um, to generate glucose from other sources, including, um, including fat, okay? So if you have disorders of fatty, free fatty, of, of fatty acid metabolism, then that can be a cause of hypoglycemia, especially after prolonged fasting. So you have here you have a list of all the possible enzyme deficiencies which I'll not go into, but just keep it in keep in uh, always have it at the back of your mind that if a patient has uh, hypoglycemia after prolonged fasting, then you need to look for uh, disorders of fatty acid metabolism. Um, so the third is uh, met, uh, glycogen synthesis deficiency, which is also called glycogen storage disease type zero. And uh, it's usually associated with fasting hypoglycemia because of the liver's inability to store glucose. So whenever the patient feeds, they're not able to store that glucose. Uh, normally you'd store that glucose in the form of glycogen. But when you have a deficiency of glycogen synthesis, that is not possible. And what happens is after, immediately after eating, these patients will have high glucose and high lactate levels. <laughs> 
And then finally, we have disorders of hepatic glucose production. So we have lots of various types of uh, glycogen storage disorders here, um, galactosemia, hereditary fructose intolerance, among others, yeah? And these disorders basically interfere with glucose production through various defects, okay? So you may have blockage of glucose release or synthesis or prevention of gluconeogenesis. So, um, so just going on to moving on to the diagnosis. So what are some of the diagnostic clues? Because it's a lot, as you can see the etiology in persistent hypoglycemia, it's, it's, there's so much that you could possibly investigate for. So sometimes, actually many times the physical examination can guide you onto the likely cause so that you can direct your investigations towards the most uh, likely etiology. So if a patient has short stature um, or poor linear growth, uh, think about growth hormone deficiency. If they have midline defects, okay, like cleft palate, a central incisor, microphallus, like our patient, the one I presented, also think about pituitary defects. If they have poor weight gain, okay, or ambiguous genitalia, think about adrenal, uh, adrenal deficiency. If they have a uh, hepatomegaly, um, it's important to consider glycogen storage diseases. Um, if the patient has pigmentation, then also think about adrenal insufficiency. And uh, again, like I already mentioned, if they're large for gestational age, uh, we need to uh, investigate for uh, hyperinsulinism. But also keeping in mind that some children with hyperinsulinism may be born premature and may be small for gestational age. So those may be missed. So you can actually have SGA babies who have hyperinsulinism. So in terms of laboratory diagnosis, um, so we can, uh, we have two methods of testing. So we can screen and then you can do a confirmatory test. So using the glucose strips and the glucometers that you have in the world, that is basically a screening test, yeah? But you need to be alive to the fact that they can give incorrect values, especially if this, either the strips are too old or expired or when the glucose level is very low, okay? So it's usually recommended that when, when you screen and find uh, hypoglycemia, it's always good to do a confirmatory test in the laboratory, okay? And uh, the, the, the sample taken for laboratory analysis should be analyzed as soon as possible because the longer it stays before analysis, the chances are very, the, the longer the chances of having a lower glucose level because of the uh, glycolysis by the uh, erythrocytes. So, Usually the levels fall by, can fall by, uh, by up to one millimole per liter per hour. And that can also give you falsely low values. So usually the difference between the, the glucose level in whole blood and plasma is uh, about 10 to 18% or about 0.5 to one millimole per liter, okay? So it, it's always important to confirm your measurement in the lab, but do not delay treatment while waiting for confirmatory results. So initiate treatment, but send a sample to the lab for confirmation. So um, now looking at, at investigations. So I've already talked about the etiologies and we've seen that there's, there's so many causes, yeah? So for us to establish a diagnosis, it's usually not very easy. You need a, what you call a critical sample. Okay, and a critical sample is a sample that is obtained when the patient is hypoglycemic with a blood glucose of less than three millimoles per liter. Okay, so you're supposed to take the, do this test whenever the patient is hypoglycemic because in between you may not be able to pick some of the, 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 the issues, especially the hormone deficiencies. For example, when you're hypoglycemic, you expect that your um, insulin level will be low. So if it's high, it tells you it's hyperinsulinism. If you're hypoglycemic, you expect that your, your, your growth hormone, the counter-regulatory hormones will go up. The growth hormone, the glucagon, okay? They should be high, the cortisol. So if you do, you take a, hypo, a, a critical sample and your cortisol is low, then that tells you there's possibly a cortisol deficiency. So I know these tests are not available, not, or not all these tests are available, but again, like I said, you should be guided by the, the clinical picture, the physical examination. But as just basic, we should be able to at least do the ketones and we look at how to interpret the critical sample shortly. 
I, I believe we should all be able to at least do ketones in the, which can be done in urine. Reducing substances can be done although in private labs, but it's also not expensive, okay? Electrolytes, most of our labs, I believe should be able to do that. So if you have a, a hyponatremia and hyperkalemia, for example, that is suggestive of adrenal deficiency or insufficiency. Um, liver function test and uh, um, blood gas analysis if available. But the most important test to do, if you're limited financially, okay, and in terms of availability of, 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 in, of, uh, of the investigations in your lab, the most important you should always look for is insulin, rule out hyperinsulinism. So at least do your ketones. If your ketones are, are zero, um, do your insulin level, do your, at least your electrolytes, okay? And then from there, if those are negative, now we can consider other possible causes. Um, and then of course, we can also do imaging, okay? Depending on what we find, uh, from the laboratory tests, we can consider doing an MRI. If you're suspecting pituitary, do an MRI of the pituitary. And, uh, uh, and even uh, for if you're suspecting an insulinoma, for example, then you'd need to do a, a PET scan of the, of the, of the pancreas. Can guide you on, on what type of insulinoma we have, whether it's diffuse or focal. So I like this flowchart because it's kind of guides on 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 how to approach a diagnosis of hypoglycemia, a stepwise approach. Although sometimes it can also be tricky because you cannot take so you, you may not have so many opportunities to get a critical sample. So normally we recommend that whenever you have a patient, when a present, patient presents to you with hypoglycemia. Just take like about five to eight cc's of, 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 of blood in a, a plain bottle, okay? If you're in the counties, for example, and you have that opportunity, take the sample and as you're referring the patient, refer them with that sample. And then uh, the investigations can be done uh, later on, yeah, in, in a, a facility where the, the lab tests are available, okay? So, uh, so just going back to this flowchart, so if you have hypoglycemia, you want to know whether there's acidosis or no acidosis, which can be assessed using the blood gas, okay? If there's acidosis, is there lactic acidosis or is it ketoacidosis, okay? If there's lact lactic acidosis, now start thinking about uh, glycogen storage disorders and disorders of uh, gluconeogenesis, okay? Um, if there's ketoacidosis, then we have these other differentials here. Okay, if there's no acidosis, okay, um, and you do your ketones, your ketones are low. So whenever your ketones are low, think about two possibilities, hyperinsulinism and a disorder of free fatty acid metabolism. So if your ketones are low, you need to check your insulin level and you need to check for your, fatty, uh, the, your free fatty acid levels, okay? So in disorders of uh, fatty acid, uh, in, in fatty acid oxidation disorders, you'll have low ketones and increased uh, free fatty acids. Well, in hyperinsulinism, both will, will be low, both the ketones and the free fatty acids. Um, so again, just to summarize interpretation of the critical sample, beta hydroxybutyrate is a ketone body. So again, like I said, if it's low, think about hyperinsulinism and think about a disorder of fatty acid oxidation. So you do your free fatty acid levels, and then you proceed from there. If you have high lactate levels, think about disorders of gluconeogenesis and uh, glycogenolysis. Okay, so that's it for diagnosis. So we move on to management. Um, and what are our goals of treatment? So our aim is to detect and treat a low blood glucose as fast as possible. So we want to use an intervention that will provide a rapid rise in blood glucose to a self safe level, okay? And of course, we want to eliminate the risk for injury and also to relieve symptoms quickly. Um, uh, kindly launch the next poll question. Okay, so what would be the, the immediate management of hypoglycemia in this case? So we had a, a patient I presented for those who came late, a neonate who presented with hypoglycemia on day one of life with seizures, and the birth weight was 3.9 kilos, okay? Um, so how would you, what would be the immediate management of hypoglycemia in this patient? A, 7.8 mil, mils of 5% dextrose over two minutes. B, 19.5 mils of 5% dextrose over two minutes. Uh, C, 7.8 mils of 10% dextrose over two minutes. 
D, 19.5 mils of 10% dextrose over two minutes, and E, 17.8 mils of 50% dextrose over two minutes. So what would be the immediate management uh, of hypoglycemia in a 3.9 kg neonates? Okay, we can have a look at the answer, the results. Okay. So 47% say 7.8 mils of 10% dextrose over two minutes. Okay, let's see. Okay, so here I have a sample algorithm. Uh, this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics for screening for uh, screening and management of hypoglycemia in neonates. Okay, and uh, the record sorry it's in 40 milligrams per deciliter. For those who uh, don't, uh, so to convert from milligrams per deciliter to millimoles per liter, usually a conversion factor of 18. So you divide that by 18, that will give in millimoles per liter. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommends. Uh, and this is a guideline for 2011, recommends uh, for symptomatic. Um, so these are at risk babies. We had the ones we had talked about, uh, SGA, LGA, uh, infant of diabetic mother, you know, premature babies, they need to be screened. Okay, so it recommends that if the patient is symptomatic and the glucose is less than 2.2, that should be, uh, 40 is about 2.2 millimoles per liter, then that patient should receive IV glucose, okay? If they're asymptomatic, then in the first four hours, uh, the recommendation is to feed as soon as possible, usually within one hour, okay? And then screen glucose, uh, do a blood glucose within 30 minutes after the first feed. Um, and then if the initial screen is less than uh, 25, that is uh, about uh, 1.3 millimoles per liter, okay? Then you give, uh, you feed again and check in an hour, if it's still uh, low, then you give IV glucose, okay? If it's above 1.3 millimoles per liter, then you refeed and give IV glucose as, as needed. Beyond four, beyond four hours, up to 24 hours, uh, again, uh, recom recommend feeding every uh, two to three hours. And uh, they recommend screening glucose prior to each feed. Now I've seen some setups have, uh, some setups have uh, modified this to screening like every six to eight hours. And probably we also need to come up with our own guidelines, uh, which are implementable in our setup. Yeah? So here they recommend screen, uh, screening prior to each feed. Other screen every six to eight hours. If the glucose is below 35 milligrams per deciliter, which is about uh, 1.9, below 1.9, okay? Then feed and recheck in one hour. If it's still low, then you give IV glucose. Okay, if it's above that, then uh, feed, and then later on, depending on what your findings are, because we, remember we are screening for the first 24 hours, eh? uh, you'll give IV glucose depending on how low the glucose is and the, 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 this, the presentation of the patient. Um, so for 
uh, initial manage, emergency management of hypoglycemia, the recommendation is to administer 10% glucose for neonates at two meals per kg, okay? Two to four meals per kg. And this should be given slowly over two, over, over about two to four minutes, okay? So looking at our patient who's 3.9 kgs, uh, the majority actually got it correct. If you're giving two meals per kg for a 3.9 kg baby, that would be 7.8 meals um, of 10% dextrose over two to three minutes, okay? And then once you correct the hypoglycemia to prevent a rebound uh, hypoglycemia, okay, then you need to maintain them on an IV infusion um, if they're not feeding, okay? But if they're feeding, then we recommend uh, maintaining the feeds. Um, and, and depending also on the glucose levels as you're monitoring, are your feeds able to achieve the opt optimal glucose levels or not, yeah? Or do you need to give um, additional glucose? So you may actually need to adjust the glucose infusion rate depending on your blood glucose levels and whether it's adequate uh, or not. Um, so just to simplify, so the suggested treatment thresholds, um, any symptomatic infant with a glucose of less than 2.5, okay? Um, so that is a symptomatic infant. If they're asymptomatic, if they have a glucose of less than 1.3, then you give IV glucose. Um, if it's above, uh, if it's above that, between 1.3, it's 1.3 and above, then uh, it's recommended to feed if possible, okay? And the therapeutic target uh, is a glucose of above 2.5 to 3.5. Uh, again, I find guidelines giving different figures. Others give 2.5, uh, others give above 3.5. Um, <clears throat> so feeding, uh, we cannot overemphasize the importance of early feeding uh, for neonates. So of course we recommend early introduction of breastfeeds. We already said within one hour, if possible. Breastfeeding actually maintains stable blood glucose levels. What happens when you're giving other sources of other feeds, for example, like formula or glucose, yeah? Your sugars will go up, okay? But because they'll go really high, you'll, your, your insulin level will also go really high. So they end up with a high insulin level and then eventually they, they get a hypoglycemia. So the advantage of breastfeeding over even formula feeding is that it maintains stable blood glucose levels without a rebound hypoglycemia. And then studies have found that um, babies who are breastfed actually um, tolerate hypoglycemia better because they tend to have uh, fairly high ketone levels, yeah, which are, I already mentioned are an alternative fuel um, or an alternative source of energy. So compared to formula fed babies, the breastfed babies tolerate uh, hypoglycemia very well. Um, so again, what are the indications for IV therapy? I think you've already mentioned some of them. We said if the blood glucose level is less than 1.3, regardless of whether they're symptomatic or not, if they are into, they are not able to tolerate oral feeds, um, if they are symptomatic, and uh, if you're giving oral feeds but you're still not able to maintain uh, adequate glucose levels, your sugars are still less than 2.5, then uh, that's a patient that we need to consider intravenous. Uh, dextrose. So I already mentioned about the glucose infusion rate, and there's a very nice simple formula here that can guide you on how to calculate. So this is a formula, the percent dextrose. So for example, if you're giving 10% dextrose, so you use 10, okay? You multiply by the meals per kg per day of fluids you're giving, multiply by 0 0.007. Um, so for example, if you have a patient who is on uh, 150 meals per kg per day, of 10% uh, dextrose, okay? So you will multiply 10 by 150 by 0 0.007. And that one will give you a figure of about 10. So that tells you your glucose infusion rate is about 10 milligrams per, milligrams per, uh, milligrams per, per minute, okay? So um, this is important because it tells you if a patient has high, high glucose requirements. Like we said, if the glucose requirements, the glucose infusion rate is more than eight, then start thinking about hyperinsulinism, okay? And remember that if you have to give any concentration of dextrose above 10%, like from 12.5% and above, then you need to, you cannot use a peripheral line, you need to have a central line. So for the older children, uh, you can use this simple algorithm, okay? So if the glucose is uh, less than 2.5, confirm in the lab 
okay? And as you're confirming, of course, you're correcting, okay? So you don't wait for the, the results to come back from the lab, and then you give a bolus, okay? Uh, for children, older children, we use five meals per kg per day. Like I said, for units, we use two to four meals per kg. I mean, sorry, uh, five meals per kg as a bolus, okay? And for units, two to four meals per kg. And then you recheck in 30 to 60 minutes. If the glucose is still low, then uh, you maintain them on a, you have already initiated an infusion. So here we've been initiated like six to eight milligrams per kg per minute. So if it's still low, then you can increase the infusion rate. If it's above 2.5, then um, start feeds as soon as possible. And uh, when do you decide to stop the infusion? If your glucose is at least, you have at least two readings, uh, two blood glucose readings above 2.5 and the patient is on full feeds, then we can actually taper off the, the intravenous glucose. Um, I'm sure many, most of us are familiar with this. So if you, you're, you're in your facility, you don't have 10% dextrose, then you can actually prepare that from, uh, from water for injection and 50% glucose. So you'll use four parts water for injection and one part, 50% glucose. If you don't have uh, water for injection or you, and you have 5% dextrose, then use nine parts of 5% dextrose and one part of glucose or 50% glucose. So if you don't have 10% glucose, you can always uh, prepare that based on uh, the, uh, the what, what, whatever solutions you have in your facility. So always remember that we do not recommend 50% dextrose, okay? In the poll, I, I, I saw some, some so I think there were, there were some answers or on administering 50% dextrose. We do not recommend 50% dextrose because it, uh, it increases the risk of hyposmolar cerebral injury. So for correction, we use 10% dextrose. Um, it's also important to remember that we do not want to give so frequent boluses. As I already mentioned that when you're giving boluses, you get an insulin surge and then you get rebound hypoglycemia. So we try to use a maximum of two boluses and then you have a maintenance, yeah? And then based on your maintenance, based on your glucose levels, you can increase your, the amount of glucose you're delivering uh, from your maintenance fluids. So let me talk about uh, glucagon, okay? So this is another alternative for management of severe hypoglycemia, especially for patients with diabetes, and then we'll see for what other conditions going on. But I would just like us to familiarize ourselves with glucagon. It can be administered uh, um, intravenously, uh, intramuscularly, or subcutaneously, okay? And uh, the recommended dose, uh, how does, uh, the recommended dose is one milligram for adults and children above 25 kgs. And for uh, children who are below 25 kgs, but beyond the neonatal period, you can you give 0 0.5 milligrams. For neonates, the dose is 20 mics per kg uh, with a max dose of one milligram. So it's important to remember that glucagon induces vomiting and nausea, okay? And uh, so always be aware, the patient may develop nausea and vomiting, which may persist for some time after glucagon administration. So the patient needs uh, uh, continuous close observation until that resolves after treatment. So how does glucagon work? Uh, just like the endogenous glucagon, it works on the glycogen stores in the liver, okay? So it causes uh, glycogen, uh, glycogen, glycogen breakdown to generate glucose, okay? So, that means that if you do not have uh, adequate glycogen stores, then your glucagon will not work, okay? And this would happen in cases of prolonged fasting. If someone has taken uh, uh, alcohol, for example, okay? And in small for gestational age babies, eh? they usually don't have, and even premature babies, they don't have adequate glycogen stores. So glucagon may not be effective in, in, uh, in, in that scenario. So in such cases, parental glucose would be the therapy of choice. Um, so, uh, so once you have given your dextrose, uh, in, in case we, we, the patient is still not responding despite the, the, um, the interventions with the glucose, and if it's three to five days and it's still, uh, hypoglycemia is still persisting, we can consider other adjunctive therapy even as to investigate for the cause. I've already talked about glucagon. You can use that in patients uh, who have adequate glycogen stores, like they, those who are appropriate for gestational age or large for gestational age, okay? Hydrocortisone may also be used or prednisolone. 
And how does this work? It, uh, remember what we said cortisol is a counter-regulatory hormone. So it does basically what cortisol does. It increases gluconeogenesis and uh, it also increases the effects of glucagon. So this can be used in, in premature or SGA babies. Rarely we may require diazoxide, somatostatin and pancreatectomy. And I'll discuss that in the next slide as we look at hyper, uh, management of hyperinsulin, uh, hyperinsulinemia. So for patients who have hyperinsulinemia, uh, these are the options we have diazoxide, and uh, these are the mechanisms by which it works. I will not go into so much detail because most of the time, by the time we get to this, the patient is probably being managed by an endocrinologist, but it's just good to know that these are treatment options. We have diazoxide, we have ocrotide, which are all locally available, okay? And then there's, uh, in case you're not able to, the patient is not responding to this, you can go to glucagon. And diazoxide is always administered with uh, hydrochlorothiazide because uh, it causes fluid retention. And uh, also the hydrochlorothiazide causes hyperglycemia. So it kind of synergistic, it potentiates the effect of diazoxide. Um, and then if they have, uh, if the patient uh, is not responsive to medical treatment, then pancreatectomy may be considered. Then other specific causes uh, will be managed depending on the etiology. So if they have uh, cortisol deficiency, uh, treatment is hydrocortisone. If they have growth hormone deficiency, treatment is growth hormone. And then for patients who have uh, been, uh, metabolic disorders or inborn errors of metabolism, like glycogen storage disorders, disorders of, disorders of fatty acid metabolism, then the recommendation is that they should avoid prolonged fasting and they should have a ready supply of uh, complex carbohydrates, long acting complex carbohydrates. So normally what we advise is they use uncooked cornstarch, okay? usually about two, at a dose of about two grams per kg per day, at night 1.5 grams per kg per day. So that actually works really well in preventing hypoglycemia. And then of course, frequent feeds. If they have a, a fructose intolerance, then fructose should be avoided. So I will just uh, briefly, as I um, coming to a close, I will mention about hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes mellitus, because I'm sure many of us in our uh, different facilities are coming to contact with these patients. And um, we have a poll question. Can you launch the poll question? <laughs> okay, so risk factors for hypoglycemia in children and adolescents with diabetes mellitus include the following except, so which one is not a risk factor? So exercise, shorter duration of diabetes, alcohol ingestion, psychological distress, and sleep. So which among these are not a risk factor for hypoglycemia in a patient with diabetes? Okay, I think we can see the results. Okay, so majority, that's 54% say sleep is not a risk factor for hypoglycemia in children. And 19% uh, say shorter duration of diabetes. So let's see what the risk factors are. Um, so some of the Possible precipitants of hypoglycemia, of course, include excess insulin. Okay, so if the insulin dose is not being titrated uh, properly, if they are not taking food, maybe they are skipping meals. Okay, exercise is a risk factor for hypoglycemia because exercise actually increases improve, increases insulin sensitivity, and uh, sleep is actually a risk factor. Okay, why? 
uh, we are going to see in the next slide, we are going to talk about nocturnal hypoglycemia later on, but uh, we'll see that the responses to hypoglycemia are reduced. The ability to respond to hypoglycemia is reduced during sleep. So it's actually a risk factor for, in fact, for severe hypoglycemia. Then we have alcohol, alcohol ingestion. Um, <clears throat> Then we have uh, impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. We look at hypoglycemia and awareness uh, in a few slides. And uh, previous someone who has a previous history of severe hypoglycemia is at higher risk of hypoglycemia. Longer duration of diabetes is also a risk factor of hypo for hypoglycemia because they are probably at higher risk of uh, having hypoglycemia and awareness and probably even better control of glucose. So they're more likely to have lower blood glucose levels. And then we have comorbidities that are associated with hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes. Uh, autoimmune conditions like celiac disease, which will impair your, um, your absorption, intestinal absorption of food. Addison's disease, which is adrenal insufficiency. Um, when you have low cortisol, you tend to have low glucose levels, okay? Hypothyroidism is also a risk factor. And of course, psychological distress, especially in adolescents, yeah? Uh, they go through a lot of things, so you may have... Uh, they may skip meals, they may sometimes even deliberately inject excess insulin. So psychological factors can result in hypoglycemia. So I will just look at nocturnal hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes because this is very common and it's important for us to be aware. Um, like I already alluded to, the counter-regulatory responses during sleep are attenuated or reduced. Eh? And especially for patients with type 1 diabetes, they are more, much less likely to be um, awakened at night by hypoglycemia. So when should you suspect that a patient with diabetes has uh, nocturnal hypoglycemia? If their pre uh, breakfast readings are low, so their fasting sugars in the morning, if they are, you're observing a trend of low blood glucose readings, then you need to suspect nocturnal hypoglycemia. If the patient, if the parent reports that the child has, is having nightmares at night, yeah? Or if there's a history of confusion or seizures, then think about, hypoglycemia, nocturnal hypoglycemia. When the child wakes up, if the mother reports that they're usually lethargic in the morning or uh, they're complaining of headache, yeah, or they have altered mood, then also suspect nocturnal hypoglycemia. And, and this is actually, it's usually very worrying for parents and it can limit management. So you may find parents, if, if they're not advised on how to prevent this, parents may actually opt to even omitting insulin doses. Yeah? Um, and, and you know what I would say is you'd rather have hyperglycemia than hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia is it's likely to kill you faster. So you really do not want a patient having uh, nocturnal hypoglycemia. And it's usually more likely if the patient is very active during the day or if they're eating poorly or if they are ill. So we usually recommend that the blood glucose level is, check, is checked at bedtime. And occasionally we'd advise them to test their glucose levels at around 2 or 3 a.m., okay? Um, at bedtime, we recommend that the glucose should be at least eight, around eight and above. If it's below eight, then we advise that they take a snack, like a glass of milk, okay, before bedtime, so that you don't get the hypo at night. So how do you manage? So I've already mentioned some of those. So uh, of course, if they're having nocturnal hypos, it means you will need to reduce the insulin dose, okay? If, if especially if they're they're having they are really they are they're very active during the day, maybe they have. Um, a lot of exercise during the day, then you advise that the dose be adjusted downwards. Uh, we can also recommend bedtime uh, carbohydrate or a snack, but whatever you're recommending at bedtime should not, uh, should not be at the expense of uh, glucose. It's, so it should not contribute to hyperglycemia because if you, sometimes they may take too much carbohydrate such that now you start getting hyperglycemia, nocturnal hyperglycemia and fasting hyperglycemia. So that should also be controlled. Um, the new analog insulins like uh, Lantus are actually very good because they, like Lantus doesn't have a peak. So insulin, which, which I know is what's mostly available in our facilities, like NPH, usually it's associated with hypoglycemia, nocturnal hypoglycemia, because it has a peak. And even uh, regular insulin, it has a higher risk of hypoglycemia. So the analogs like uh, Lantus, the Lispro, sorry, the analogs like Glagin, Lispro, uh, aspart, they tend to have less uh, uh, hypoglycemia. And then of course, monitoring blood glucose is helpful in preventing, identify, it helps us to identify and to prevent hypoglycemia. And then uh, we also need to be aware 
about uh, the possibility of hypoglycemia and awareness. And this is a syndrome in which the patient's ability to detect the onset of hypoglycemia is diminished. Remember we said usually you are able to detect hypoglycemia when you develop the autonomic symptoms, okay? So if someone has been having so many hypos, yeah, or even uh, overnight hypoglycemia, the body kind of resets its response, its adrenaline response, such that that response will occur at a lower level. So a patient may have a glucose of two, for example, and they have no symptoms. And that is actually very dangerous because they will not intervene. And then now you end up with neurohypoglycemia or neuroglyc neuro, sorry, neuroglycopenia, which can result in um, can 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 result in, uh, in in coma and even seizures or you know even loss of life. Yeah, so uh, it's important that this is also identified. Whenever you see your patient, always ask them, at what level do you recognize hypoglycemia? If your glucose is three, do you have any symptoms? If it's two, do you have any symptoms? If they don't don't have any symptoms, then you need to intervene. And uh, what you normally advise is we adjust the blood glucose targets. Uh, to, uh, and, and the insulin to avoid hypoglycemia for like two to three weeks, yeah? So you probably need to reduce your insulin dose, okay? So that your targets are higher than what was previously set so that they can actually regain that hypoglycemia awareness. So in terms of treatment of hypoglycemia for patients with diabetes, um, if, if it's, uh, of course, if it's, we've talked about severe and non-severe, of course, if it's non-severe, usually we recommend taking a, a rapidly acting carbohydrate okay? Not rapidly acting carbohydrates. So whatever we are giving, it should, it's something that should make the blood glucose rise as fast as possible because hypoglycemia is an emergency, okay? And uh, the recommended dose is 0.3 grams per kg, okay, um, of, of a carbohydrate. And these are the carbohydrates that we normally recommend. So glucose, sugar, honey, juice, or even soda, okay? Those are rapidly acting carbohydrates, okay? So an example is 15 grams of carbohydrates is, would be equivalent to three glucose tablets or three teaspoons of, um, of sugar or three teaspoons of glucose, okay? Or three teaspoons of honey or equivalent to three quarter cup of juice. So normally what you say is they take the glucose or sugar and they mix it with a little water and then they, they take it orally. And then after treatment, they're supposed to retest the blood glucose after 15 minutes. So they must retest to make sure that the glucose has come back to normal. If they retest and it's still low, then they need to repeat the same, okay? If it has come back to normal, then now they need to, they need to take a, a, a more complex carbohydrate. So I would like to emphasize that we should avoid fat containing seeds, foods such as chocolate, milk, even biscuits, yeah? Because the absorption of glucose is very slow. So it will not correct the glucose as rapidly as is desirable. So once the hypoglycemia has been reversed, if the patient's next meal is more than an hour away, then we advise that they take 15 grams of a slow acting carbohydrate such as a sandwich. Um, you can take a sandwich with a protein, yeah, or even biscuits or milk. Okay, if their next meal is due, then they should take their meal. So for severe hypoglycemia, again, I've already talked about this. It's the management is the same, even for patients with diabetes, you can give IV glucose depending on their setting. <clears throat> if they're in hospital, you give IV glucose. If they're at home and they have glucagon, then uh, glucagon can, can be administered um, in the doses that I had already mentioned. So in terms of prevention, um, so of course, this is specifically for diabetes. We recommend, we usually advise the patients to avoid skipping meals, so they should eat regular meals, okay? Uh, it's advisable that they check their blood sugar before exercise and every 30 minutes. If the exercise is gonna last for more than 30 minutes, then every 30 minutes they need to be checking their glucose level or they take a snack, okay? And then um, medi medication uh, should also be adjusted before physical activity. And the blood glucose should be checked, uh, as I already mentioned, every 30 minutes during physical activity. Yeah, and the uh, alcoholic beverages should be consumed with a snack. So for all that, uh, for adolescents and older children, older, you know, older patients maybe, who are driving, then you also need to give them advice on driving, okay? So if a patient has hypoglycemia and unawareness, that patient should never drive, okay? 
until that is sorted. Um, so normally we advise that the blood glucose should be checked before driving. And if it's a long drive, they should check. So at least every four hours to check the, uh, the blood sugar levels. If the blood glucose was below four, uh, when there was, um, uh, if the blood glucose is below four, then that needs to be corrected before they, they proceed, okay? Um, so they need to take a carbohydrate treatment. And anytime they, they have symptoms of hypoglycemia or suspect, then they should stop and test, okay? And take a carbohydrate. Um, if they have corrected, they had a hypoglycemia and they have corrected, they should not drive immediately. They should wait at least about one hour before uh, proceeding um, to drive. And then we always advise them to always have, for all patients with diabetes, uh, not only those who are driving, they should always carry blood glucose monitoring equipment and supplies of uh, rapidly absorbable carbohydrates, which should be within easy reach when they're driving. Um, so also glucagon, I, I know it's not widely available, but it is there, although it's, uh, it's a, a bit expensive, but it's very useful to have uh, in case of an emergency. And uh, it's important to educate patients on administration of glucagon, and they should also wear some form of identification or warning of diabetes in case of an emergency. So what is the prognosis? Uh, the prognosis depends, of course, on the underlying condition. So like for inborn errors of metabolism and hormonal deficiencies, these are lifelong diseases that require lifelong treatment and the patient should be, um, should be made aware and educated on this. If it's hyperinsulinism, the prognosis also varies depending on the severity of the disease. Huh? So if the lesion is focal, uh, it's probably usually focal lesions are amenable to surgery, surgical intervention. If it's diffuse, now it may be very tricky we may try medical therapy and it works or it doesn't. And sometimes we may require pancreatectomy, which now means that you're going to have diabetes to deal with. So the prognosis depends on uh, the cause of the hyperinsulinism. Yes, and that is the end of my presentation. Um, thank you. And uh, I think we can take questions. Tanya, are you there? Hello, sorry, <laughs> hadn't unmuted. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. It was really uh, quite uh, detailed. I'm sure everybody uh, feels the same way. So we can go to the Q&A and, okay, so now. There's a question here that asks uh, for you to help uh, 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 a team out where they don't have 10% uh, or 50% dextrose. They only have 5% dextrose. So um, how would they manage the hypoglycemia in this uh, scenario? Okay, so I had a slide on that, on how to prepare 50% from 5%. And uh, let me see if I can get that slide. Yes, please. Mm. Yeah, so if you don't have 10% dextrose, you can actually prepare that from 50% uh, dextrose and water for injection. So you mm. combine four parts of water for injection with one part of 50% dextrose. So um, you can see a table here, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you are using, for example, a 10 uh, CC syringe, then you take eight CC of water and two CC of glucose, okay, or 50% glucose. Um, mm. if, you're, if you have 5% dextrose and 50% dextrose, then the ratio is uh, nine to one, nine, uh, nine to one of 5% to 50% glucose. So if you're using a 10 mil syringe, you'll take nine mils of 5% dextrose and one mil of 50% uh, dextrose. Okay. I hope I that's clear. The, no, I think the problem is that they, they have neither. Um, they don't mm. have the 10% or the 50%. They only have 5%. Oh, they only have 5%. That's, that's, yeah, I think that's the, the, the issue. Yeah, that is very tricky. 
because <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if the five percent. Well, of course, the five percent will will bring up the glucose, but I don't know if it. Will, I, I doubt it. It would bring it up adequately. Mm. Yeah. So, so but of course, solution. it's better than nothing. Yeah. If that's all you have solution. and you're stuck, yeah, then yeah. you'd give that. Yeah. Maybe we should advise them to ask the uh, facility to order the appropriate uh, concentration of glucose as well when they are yeah. waiting. Yeah. Yeah. So we have be... another question from an, an anonymous attendee who says, um, if a diabetic patient needs to exercise, how should they go about it to avoid hypoglycemia? I, uh, I, I, uh, we had some, some of that, but how to avoid hypoglycemia in, in particular? Okay, so that's a very important question. And, and for all patients with diabetes, visually exercise management is part of the things that we need to discuss with them, okay? So glucose testing is very important. Um, and I'm, I'm referring specifically to type one diabetes patients who are on insulin. So normally mm -hmm. we advise that they have to test before they begin their exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, even before they begin, we usually recommend that they should start exercise at least two hours after, after their last um, pre-meal insulin dose, eh? because the risk of hypoglycemia is lower. And then um, they test before they begin the exercise. If it's between, uh, if the blood glucose is between seven and 14, usually we say it's okay to go ahead and exercise. But if it's be below seven millimoles per liter, then they need to take a snack. Okay, usually mm -hmm. a carbohydrate, uh, about 10 grams, 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrates, which could be a sandwich, for example, okay? Mm -hmm. And then after that, they are good to go. But they still need to, if, if the exercise is going to last more than 30 minutes, then they need to still test every 30 minutes. If they're not able to test, then they always need to have a snack. Every 30 minutes, they stop and take a snack, usually 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrates, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, if it's above 14, that means this patient is insulin deficient. Is uh, ins insulin deficient, so they are at risk of of, uh, of of going into DKA during the exercise. Yeah, so if it's above fourteen, then that needs to be corrected. Normally, we tell them to take lots of water because that usually helps to bring down the glucose. If that doesn't work, then they need to give an additional uh, dose of insulin to correct the the sugar. Then once it comes down to between seven and fourteen, then uh, they can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I've seen one, uh, there's an additional uh, question um, about the uh, child abuse. Um, we, it was one of the differentials for the hypoglycemia. So the, the uh, attendee asks, kindly clarify child abuse uh, for when you're testing the C-peptide levels in the body to determine if the insulin is exogenous. Okay, so that's a good question. So um, if you have, if you're suspecting insulin, high insulin as the cause of hypoglycemia, then you do your insulin levels and you find it's high. So C-peptide is an indicator of endogenous insulin production. So mm -hmm. when you measure your C-peptide level, it tells you that the insulin is endogenous. Okay, so the patient has, it's producing uh, a lot of insulin. But if C-peptide is low and yet your insulin level is high, then it tells you that that is uh, due to exogenous insulin administration. Okay, so yeah, you have to do them in tandem. You can't do one and uh, uh, not the other. Yes, in, you have to do both. Things. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a, another uh, question, I think that it's important to address uh, from an at anonymous attendee. Um, is normal saline or ringer's lactate used in case of hypoglycemic risk? if no dextrose is in stock? And if so, what's the ratio in units? So I, I think this Sorry. is also important. I didn't, I didn't get the question, can you repeat? The, uh, the person is asking, if there is no dextrose, can they use saline or ring as lactate? Uh, saline does not have glucose. So you cannot use saline to correct hypoglycemia. And ring as lactate, has very little glucose, so if at all, yeah. So it's yeah. no, I would not recommend using that. So if you're in a health facility, you just need to make sure you have your glucose. It's an emergency drug, so you cannot afford not mm -hmm. to have glucose. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's definitely no two ways about um, yes. getting the, the appropriate amount of uh, dextrose. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know if you have any last uh, qu uh, comments you'd like to make on or parting shots about uh, hypoglycemia, what people should remember. Yeah. Um, so probably I, I didn't just, uh, I, I forgot to um, just finalize on the case I presented. Eh? Okay. Um, we tend to think that hypoglycemia is rare, but it may not be the case. There are probably patients with hypoglycemia are probably out there and they're being missed. Yeah. An example mm -hmm. is we've seen patients who have uh, who present with convulsions. We had a two-year-old child who presented with uh, has been on management for con convulsions since six months of age, and we actually discovered that they have been been having hypoglycemia and we suspect an inborn error of metabolism. So this means that we really need to look out for it and have a high index of suspicion. So they may not be. The, uh, it may not be as rare as we think. For the case I presented, actually, the patients uh, ended up, uh, we, we just found out that they have multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. Remember, they had mm -hmm. a microphala. So we did mm -hmm. the, uh, we took the critical sample, uh, insulin was normal, um, we were not able to do growth hormone, but cortisol was low. So the patient has adrenal insufficiency and is on hydrocortisone. And uh, an MRI actually confirmed that they have an, um, an absent uh, anterior pituitary and an ectopic so what mm -hmm. I'm just saying is we really need to have a high index of suspicion and look out for these children. These patients who present with seizures, always, always you must check your blood glucose. Because I, I find even in the wards, patient has been convulsing for three days and at no point has a blood glucose been taken. All sick mm -hmm. children must have a blood glucose taken. Yeah. So those are my parting shots. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It was quite informative, as I'm sure uh, we've, we've seen. Um, there are quite a number of questions, and I'm sure uh, if anybody has a pressing question, they could probably direct it to the organizers who would be able to get a response for you from um, Dr. Amolo. The other thing that I would like to say is that there is no alternative to glucose in the management of hypoglycemia. So giving other things, uh, which I, I've noted with concern, is it happens. And that's how, as Dr. Amolo said, hypoglycemia can easily kill a patient. So thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, webinar. We look forward to seeing you to our upcoming webinars. There's a schedule being shown on your screen right now. Thank you very much. And see you next time. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Bye-bye.